COVID-19, why you do this to me? I really don't like being stuck in quarantine. I have no toilet paper, I don't even have a snack. Hey, coronavirus, I want my life back. Promises to be an interesting show. Promises to be a very interesting show. And I'm going to be breaking some rules in a bit. Uh, my own rules. But it's necessary. Before we do that, though, let us get to our first order of business. That, of course, is what are you grateful for today? Uh, let's start uh, populating, that, uh, populating that board. Parker, what is everybody grateful for today? Grateful for all of you. Oh, Diana, you're copping out on that one. Come on, come on, give me something better. Watch for Diana. I want Diana to be grateful for something else. You can't say that. You can't pick, you can't pick that. We always say that. Come on, Diana. I know you can do better than that. Uh, grateful for this community. Susan, okay, all right, we'll take it. I'm grateful for Kevin and Parker for doing this every night. We, we appreciate it, and I'm grateful for all of you as well. I'm still waiting for Diana. I want to know something that you're grateful for that you saw or heard today or did today. Being alive, honestly, Aaron, yeah. Grateful for this show, Bernice. Uh, let me see, Mike Robin, I'm grateful I'm accountable for my own behavior and I'm not accountable for the behavior of others. That, you get it. You get it, my friend. Uh, what else do we have there, Parker? Grateful uh, for the weather today. I was able to weed without being attacked by mosquitoes. Uh, what else? We'll, we'll do about three or four more. Sunshine and nice weather, I like that one. What else? Seeing my family at a distance. Yeah, okay. Grateful for my neighbors from Donna. Hi, Donna. Grateful. Okay, there you go. Diana, grateful for some peace and quiet today. Okay, be grateful for that. We have one, I think, from the Goat Line as well. Sandy has something definitely to be grateful for. Hi, Sandy. Hi, Goat Line. It's Sandy calling from uh, Barry. Uh, I'm just going to say a shout out to some friends today. What a great day. I have a disability and some friends uh, went and got a tank for me from uh, Costco, filled that up, brought it over, and another friend picked up some herbs from the uh, garden center. Isn't that wonderful? Question mark. It just totally made my day. Anyway, cheers. Take care. Be safe, everybody. Uh, I love that. I love that. So thank you to everybody for, uh, of course, taking part in that as always. By the way, coming up, uh, well, I'll tell you about it right now. I got a new email address for the show because first day for your mental health was just a lot it was too long so the new email now is kevin's isolators at gmail.com kevin's isolators at gmail.com comments thoughts ideas i use a lot of your ideas on the show a lot of people who have that on the show are, are people that you have suggested so kevin's isolators at gmail.com so uh, feel free, feel free. Like I said, I'm going to be breaking a rule today. Remember I told you when we started this show 71 episodes ago, can you believe that? I said, this is all about positivity. This is not about bad news. You get bad news anywhere all day. It's giving us anxiety. It's giving us stress. But something is giving us all anxiety and stress is that, and that is seeing what's happening with the riots that have turned violent south of the border. And um, it, it, it is sadly distracting from the main message of what we need to talk about, and that is the racism. That a human being, you know what? It, it, let's really bring it down to that. A human being was killed for no reason. And that message is being lost, sadly, in, in all the, the rioting that is going on. And as usual, what's going to happen is police and the armed forces move in. They restore order. People pay lip service for a few weeks. Politicians say this will not stand anymore. And then it just goes back to what it was. And then another black man will die. And there will be more riots and more complaining. And the same thing will happen. It will play itself. It's not working. It's not working. So I need to speak out. I need to say something because we need to try something different. And hey, what about talking and listening? What about getting past all the anger and changing something? Because it is systemic. This system has been, has been built 
so that it favors old white guys like me. I don't care what you say, it does. And it's wrong. And it needs to change, and we need to change it. Politicians say they're going to change it, and a lot of them are very well-meaning, but they're only going to do it if you want them to. And I need to speak to all of you because there's a lot of us who either feel we, we, we don't belong in the debate, or we don't feel we can speak about it, or we're worried about being misunderstood, or we're worried about offending. No, we've got to put that aside. We, can, we cannot have that a, another human being subjected to treatment an animal doesn't even get. So it's going to be an interesting show. I don't know how I'm going to do on this. This is out of my comfort zone. I'm going to try and, 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 and be as, I don't know, unoffensive as possible. I, I, I don't know if that's possible, but we need to talk about it. We need to, have a, we need to have a talk about it. Not a debate. There's no debate necessary. We know it's wrong. We need to change it. And I am so thrilled that this next gentleman has agreed to join me. Now, I'm taking him out of his comfort zone a little bit, too. You usually see him at TED Talks and at Motivational Talks. Uh, his name is Asante Houghton. This is, a, this, is, this is him at a TED Talk uh, not too long. What if we designed our services to be more proactive um, than reactive? He usually speaks on mental health. Instead of He's gone through his own battles steps. of mental health. And, and so he's, he's just an incredible speaker and has changed so many lives, but he's gone through so much. However, he's the one that, 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 that changed the game a little bit with this tweet this week on his site, which is usually about mental health. me right now and i am thrilled you are here asante thank you for joining me tonight thank you thank you i appreciate it kevin um i'm really happy to be here to have this conversation what is what? and i'm writing it down because I, I don't want to remember i don't want to forget it what is performative activism for me uh, i would define performative activism as saying that you are against certain ways in which people are discriminatory and living a life where you are not challenging any of those forms of discrimination. So you're just, you feel that you are, I mean, it, it, back in the day, we used to write letters to the editor. There, I've shown them. So now we, we go on social media and we say, this is terrible what's happening in Minneapolis and this is terrible what happened in Washington. But we, we leave it at that. And then we go back, we go back and, and don't do anything about it. And that's not working either, is it? No, it's, it's not working. And, you know, uh, I think what really needs, really needs to happen is for us to start having a more honest conversation, a more open conversation about race and racism and the things that are happening and occurring in our world. And, it, it, you know, we're so smug. Uh, we say that, oh, it's all down in the U.S., uh, oh. and, and it's one thing to say, you know, the way we, that, that the, the First Nations have been treated in this country is horrible. But let's not fool ourselves. The way that black people are treated in this country is horrible as well. Uh, all I can really say to that is, yeah. Um, <laughs> and, you know, um, because for me it's very obvious, uh, based on my experience, the experiences of my friends, the experiences of my family members, uh, it's it's a thing that we are constantly thinking about, you know. Uh, I, I, it, it's like every single time I venture out into public, I, at some level, consciously or subconsciously, am preparing myself for what if I'm treated negatively because of my blackness today. You ever been stopped by the police for no reason? Oh, my God. Uh, I lost count, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so many times. Um, literally... You know, I would say on a weekly basis when I was in high school. I've never been stopped by the police. Ever. Ever. I mean, I've been stopped for, you know, for, for right. an, doing an infraction, but never simply a stop. I mean, you weren't robbing a liquor store or something like that. I mean, we don't have liquor stores here, but you weren't doing anything wrong. You were, you were just being... 
I was walking from home to school, which was a 10 minute walk. And, you know, I lived in a, you know, a more impoverished neighborhood right outside Regent Park at that time. Um, and very often I was being stopped by police officers. Who are you? What's your name? Do you know such and such person? Where are you going? Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, Do you live here outside of my house? Now, I don't want to call cops racist. All cops racist. I don't want to paint them all, all with that brush. But it's within that system of policing that black people are regularly stopped. And, and I mean, we went through all the controversy of, of, of carding and that. And, you know, it, it got to the point where we were getting in the media, we were getting descriptions of a suspect. 22-year-old uh, black male, period. Mm -hmm. And, you know, thank goodness the media sort of got on the police and said, you, you can't keep doing it. And they, and they responded as well. If you don't have a description of the person, then being a black male is not, is not a description. Well, then you're criminalizing, criminalizing all of us. Yeah. So we so so these are facts, all right. Fact is there is racism in Canada. Yeah. It is systemic. It is yeah. it is here. So we have to admit that. And like you said, first step is admitting it. And I don't think a lot of people and I grew up okay, I grew up in northern Ontario. I grew up in North Bay. And okay. so for you know, for me, we had an American Air Force base uh, up there as well. The American Air Force was was at the the base there as well. So there would be some black people, but but it, for for me, it was like I didn't think there was any racism in Canada whatsoever. And I came down here with that attitude, and and then I lived in Barrie for years, and it just it was not very apparent there. And even here in my circle, I, it's Interesting not apparent. Say that because my experience in Barrie has been not positive in in my life what? So, amongst yeah. black people like for us the conversation is you know in you know in the we talk about the greater toronto area barry is a very racist place it, so i think that kind of just illustrates the the differences in perceptions and experiences mm -hmm. that we might have just on the basis of i'm a black person you're a white person and i didn't think it was I honestly did not think it was. I, I thought you were about to say, oh, you know what? It's so much better than it is in Toronto. But I mean, it's real estate. Yeah. So, so okay. So we know the problem, okay? And, th and that's always, and, we, and, and we, we've talked many times on this show about mental health, and I'm sure you're very familiar with, with anxiety, controlling what you can control and trying not to let what you can't control. So we can't control the riots and, and, and the anger and the fighting that's going on south of the border. So what we need to turn our energy to, and it doesn't matter what color skin you have, uh, what we need to turn our energy to is what can we control? So what do you think that we can control and come away with this with a positive feeling like it's going to be okay? Well... You know, uh, I, I think that a big thing that we can really do is the same way that we are starting to normalize the conversation around mental health is starting to normalize the conversation around race and racism. And that doesn't mean to go around accusing everyone of being a racist or, you know, that kind of thing. It, it's more about, you know, being able to look at ourselves and, and say, is that thing I'm thinking or that attitude I had, um, you know, m maybe I shouldn't have that attitude or that way of thinking yet. Not to feel guilty uh, if we discover something about ourselves that maybe we think is, you know, would not be nice for others to know if others knew about it. Um, because I think sometimes there's an expectation that in this journey of anti-racism that we will never do anything that's racist or think anything that's racist. Or, you know, if we talk about other kinds of isms, you know, homophobic or transphobic or ableist or what, what have you, it's, it's being able to look inside ourselves and think, oh, maybe I did say something that was offensive that time. And not to just learn not to say it, but to understand why it was offensive and the impact that might have on someone else someone else's life and someone else's maybe self-esteem and and then their lens through which they go through the world mm -hmm. and 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 we sometimes being quiet 
can be wrong in itself. I mean, case in point would be the police officers. I think there were three police officers who were around the other one who were the, the, the officer who was, uh, had his knee on, on George Floyd's uh, neck. But there were three other officers there who could have stopped him. There are three other officers there who could have said, hey, that's wrong. Don't do that. They didn't. At least I don't think they did. I, I, I don't know. I, I'm not 100% sure either, but um, they did not stop him. Um, and we know that for sure. Uh, and, and I think that's a big piece of it, too, is that, um, you know, for many years, I, I thought to myself, well, I'm not homophobic, but, you know, my friends are saying this and making that joke. And um, then, you know, I was once confronted about my allyship and what that meant. And I started to think, wow, I need to step up and, and be brave and maybe say to my friend that, hey, that's not cool what you said. Or that thing that you think about this group of people, that's not cool. Um, and, you know, so to, to really be able to stand up uh, for others when, you know, the, that group of people who is being, you know, discriminated against or made fun of or somehow mistreated, you know, when they're not around or even when they are around, to, to always kind of commit to yourself that I'm going to live a life in which I challenge these injustices regardless of how big or how small they may be. And in saying that, I think it would be faulty to expect folks to challenge things 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. But if we could get to 80%. <laughs> Hell, 50%. 50%. <laughs> you, know? you know, just move away from, you know, zero or 5% and, and start making some big strides that way. Then I think, you know, we, we start to um, have honest conversations. And sometimes many times it probably will be uncomfortable but if you've been in a marriage before or a long-term relationship sometimes the most important conversations you have that drive your relationship forward are uncomfortable and sometimes there's yelling involved and sometimes um that needs to happen in order for uh that that bridge to be crossed between you for you to have a greater understanding of you know my experience and your experience and where everyone is coming from so that we can hopefully work together and try to come out with a positive outcome. I want to get to a word you used, allyship, in just a moment, but I also want to address something Carmen, a comment Carmen just made, and that is she cried when she saw this. And I want to emphasize to the viewers right now, this is, I want to try and get past the anger and the sadness. We, we, I'm sure you're like, you know, and I, I'm the one who's told you to turn off the news, but I watched it today and I watched it last night and, and I felt like crying too. But then I said, okay, it's not good enough to cry and it's not good enough to be sad. I want everyone who's watching right now to think, what can I do to make a difference? What can I control? And Asadi Hutton, who is a public speaker and a mental health advocate, has been gracious enough to join me and talk about this. And we're both out of our comfort zones right now a little bit talking about this, but it, it has to be a conversation. And when it comes right down to it, it shouldn't matter that he's black and I'm white. It, it's a conversation that needs to happen. So you, you use the word allyship, and you've used that word before. What is an allyship to you, and why is it important? For me, an ally is, you know, I, I think it's pretty deep uh, in, in so many ways. Well, I'll try to, I think, encompass my thoughts in simpler terms. But for me, what it means is to stand up for the dignity and respect and humanity of somebody else. Hmm. And to stand up uh, not just by yourself believing or, or you know, I think for me, like, like I was saying before, it's easy for me to kind of stand within my own values and say, I'm not that person. And that's great. You know, don't be that person. <laughs> like, don't. Um, but beyond that, it's when someone else is being you know, or saying or doing something that maybe is offensive or hurtful or discriminatory. I think being a good ally is being able to challenge that. And sometimes when we say challenge, um, people think of anger and people think of mm -hmm. um, telling people what to do or what to think. But sometimes the challenge could be asking a question about why they said a certain thing or why do they believe a certain thing. And, 
getting them to really think about where that idea came from and if that idea, you know, um, or how that idea might hurt somebody inadvertently or how that thing that they did or said might hurt somebody. And, you know, maybe to draw examples of times that they were unfairly treated and how that made them feel. I love that you were having a little bit of trouble because you're always such a refined speaker and, and when you're talking about mental health. And I love though, because, because it really tells me it's coming from your heart, that, that, that what you are saying, you're, you're, you're giving it considerable thought. So I'm sorry I put you in that position, but- That's good, man, that's what it's about. I, I know, I love that. I, I, think, I don't think we need prepared speeches. I, I, don't, I didn't know what I'm gonna say tonight. I didn't wanna to prepare too much I, because all the conversations that have been scripted have been had. Now, the, the protest too, and, and, and there's a lot of comments about, well, you know, it doesn't, you know, you're not, you're not mourning for, for the man if you're busting store windows and, and looting and setting fires to police stations and that. Okay, please understand, when it comes to these protests, folks, they're not all there mourning the loss of George Floyd. There are a lot of people who are brought in as agitators, and there are different agendas. There are political parties, there are organizations, there are groups that hire people. I saw, I, I see it here in Toronto when we have major protests. There's people here who, who, aren't, who aren't really there for the right reasons. And so what happens is that's a distraction and that, that takes us away from the message that the people who are truly there trying to affect change are, are making. So try again that's why i want you to look past the anger and the fires and and that i want you to look at the message that is there we lack leadership true leadership of someone who does of people who don't who would have the guts to say something my gosh you know i <laughs> it's really too bad that dr king never became president at, at some point because the words that that he used crossed racial barriers and and to remember that uh is they just they just touch your heart so and again i'm rambling right now I, i'm rambling right now so i apologize <laughs> because cool. we we need change we need change and we need to be the people who are the authors of that change so what can somebody watching in east york do what can somebody we were talking about you know being a true you know allyship but what can they do to educate themselves to find out what's really going on and what they can do you know um i think before i hop into my answer to that question i i, I just want to say a couple of things um uh, which are to say that you know as much as we revere dr martin luther king right now uh when he was alive um during the civil rights era, he was not a super popular person uh, among some, you know, a lot of white folks. And um, so just to remember that sometimes saying the right thing is going to be hard and you're going to be challenged by it, but you may make a change. Um, or doing the right thing might be hard, but you may make a change. Um, in terms of the protest, um, I think a thing that I think black folks and others who are oppressed but right now I'm speaking about black folks is uh, that we experience is we're often told the ways in which we should be angry or the ways in which we should be, uh, you know, protesting or raising awareness to an issue. And, um, you know, it, it seems like, you know, we, we've tried peaceful protesting and we've tried uh, a myriad of different things. And I think what we're seeing in the United States right now and to some extent here in Toronto today, uh, our individuals are, though in Toronto today, our, our protest was peaceful. So no, thank you for that. Um, but in the United States, what we're seeing are individuals who are kind of running out of answers as to what next, what can we do? But also as far as what you said too, Kevin, um, there are a lot of agitators um, who you know, uh, may have a different agenda. Um, as for what we can do here in Toronto, first I want to shout out East York because uh, you brought them up. <laughs> and, uh, I spent some some time growing up over there. Uh, you know, I have very fond memories of playing baseball in Stan Wadlow Park. Uh, so, uh, so um, shout out to East York. But um, 
uh, you know, I think what we can do is, is really, you know, one thing that I was once told by a trans person uh, when I had done something that was offensive to them. And what I actually did was, you know, I didn't actually outwardly do anything that I thought was offensive. What I did was not acknowledge that they were a trans person in a room of, you know, full of all different kinds of genders. Um, and that made them feel invisible. Uh, so, and I heard them inadvertently and I felt really bad about that. So what I did with that guilt was I invested it into learning more. And I immediately went to Google and I read every single thing I could find for a week about, you know, um, what, what, is, what does it mean to be trans? Um, and, you know, we use that as an umbrella term, but there's really a lot embedded in that. Um, you know, what is transphobia? How does transphobia work? What is, um, what does it mean to be uh, heteronormative, you know, in terms of our speech and how is our work society set up in, in very male, female ways when there are, you know, more genders that, uh, you know, that exist on our planet. So, um, you know, so for me, I really went out and I just kind of, you know, put into Google and said, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when we talk about race, we could say, what is systemic racism? Or where did racism come from? And kind of start to learn more about that, at least to get a start. And, you know, once we find out about where these things come from, um, we start to, uh, I think, not just, I mean, learning more is obviously really important, but we, we also start to remove our the, the, the guilt, I think, and I think that's really challenging for a lot of people, um, is sometimes feeling guilty, and start to think that um, though, you know, I am complicit in a system that works a particular way, but, you know, I am not the sole person responsible for it, and I think sometimes feel like they are the sole person responsible for it. However, in saying that too, um, where we do have responsibility is changing it now that we know about it um so i i think there are a lot of things that people can do is and i think one of them is really just using the resources that we have you know the internet and libraries and uh sometimes even the people in our lives and and really asking the important questions um what is racism how does it work um you know learning more about different people uh so if you don't know anything about the history of black canadians or the, the history of immigrants coming to this country or the history of First Nations people in this country. Um, you know, to learn more about that, we, we start to see the, the full picture of a person um, rather than just maybe the things we've been conditioned to see or think by media or attitudes in our family that we grew up in or neighborhood or, or community or that kind of thing. And really wanting to get the full picture of, of people because everyone is super complicated and um, when we kind of boil people down to a single story we're missing so much and in a lot of ways it kind of I don't know man it's, 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 it's like it limits the beauty of the world in which we can engage in powerful I mean, that, that, it, it's powerful and you're right, we, we miss out on so much. We deny ourselves, um, you know, and, and what happens is on a socioeconomic level, we have a disproportionate number of black people who are in public assisted housing. And therefore, there's little chance to get ahead or it's harder to get ahead, not because they're black, but because they're poor, because they have been kept poor. And so there's a, there could be a little boy right now growing up in some public housing project that has in his head the cure for cancer, but we're never going to enjoy that or enjoy the beauty of that as a society because, well, his family couldn't afford to send him to school, not because he was black, but because he was poor. So. We, we miss out on so much. We really miss out on, on so much. And you're right, talking and learning. You also, you brought, and this was a, a, a few moments ago, you brought up the fact that Martin Luther King at the time was not 
well liked. There was not there would not be a lot of white people at the time saying, "Wow, what a role model! He's incredible." So you're right, you're right. You know, it, it's time time to stand up. So that if you think he is incredible, but you don't want to say it in front of your white friends at the time, well, then you're not standing up. You're not standing up. So uh, yeah, that was that was very powerful. I want to get into something you're more comfortable with, and I want to talk about mental health. And I want to talk. I want to talk about what racism does to mental health of the of the victim. So, what if we designed our service? Uh, uh, a black person, a Chinese person, right now who who are undergoing a lot of racism, we're really doing damage to their mental health. Yeah, um, you know, it's 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 such a challenging thing. Um, you know, I, I guess I'm trying to think of the right way to explain it and the Take right your time. Example. Take your time. Um, I think many different things can happen uh, in terms of mental health. You know, uh, the, within mental health, there is this concept called. I don't know if I want to talk about it, but there's, there's a concept called learned helplessness. Um, and essentially, what that means is that when folks are put in situations that are painful for them in which they are not able to escape even when the opportunity to escape becomes available they have suffered so much pain that they are unable to see that opportunity or to try it out um in terms of anxiety anxiety is something that is sometimes characterized, many times characterized by, uh, you know, uh, just kind of an upbringing or a period of time, sometimes short, sometimes long, in which there is a lot of instability and unpredictability within one's life. Now, if you are a person who is subjected to racism and it's systemic and every new class that you enter as a kid, every um, store you walk into, you are not sure whether or not you're going to be treated fairly, all of a sudden you start to become anxious about every store you walk into or every class you walk into. And the thing about anxiety is that once it takes root, it is easy to be become generalized beyond the situation in which it started. You know, uh, and then we talk about things like depression. And, um, you know, depression is in a lot of ways... Uh, you know, an illness of pain and an abuse. So uh, the impacts of racism are often extremely painful in a way that is hard to describe. Depression could be a thing that comes out of that. Um, we talk about uh, other psychiatric disorders um, that involve maybe individuals who are perceiving, rea perceiving reality differently, hearing voices, seeing things that aren't there, experiencing delusions, and Oftentimes, individuals who experience those things, um, it, it's really, you know, there has been a lot of stress in their lives. Uh, and, you know, they kind of sometimes reach a tipping point. And when they do, um, all of a sudden they just, it's, it's like that person who's homeless on the street, um, who we might say is, you know, quote unquote, crazy or nuts. Maybe they didn't start out that way, but being on the street long enough, the stress of living that way has caused them to crack, right? So, um, and, I, I, and I think sometimes many of the things that, you know, uh, black folks are sometimes vilified for, whether it's, oh, this person isn't doing anything for themselves or uh, they're smoking too much weed or drinking too much or, uh, you know, having, you know, doing reckless things. It's, it's when you lose hope that things can change for you because a society has in many ways shown you or treated you in such a way that make it extra difficult to escape the circumstances that you might have been born into or just to exist in the world because the world for some reason that you don't understand does not want to accept you the way that you feel you should be accepted or the way that you deserve it's easy to well, you know i won't say easy but there are times when you know you, you kind of say f it and you you start to do things that um, may not necessarily be the most productive things for you in your life and your future. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. 
Well, if, if, if someone thinks that I am useless, then I will be useless then. And, and I've heard that from people living on the street as well. Sorry, Kevin. It's, it's not necessarily that I think okay. I'm useless. It's that I've been treated as if I am useless. Yeah. But would, so but I, would, you, I, not, would you not agree, though, that, that at some point then you're saying, well, if I've been treated that way and I'm constantly being that way, I might act that way. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, again, it, for me, it just comes down to that, that loss of hope. And I think hope is such an important thing. And, oh, my you know, gosh, yeah. Talk, uh, you know, if you want the one that you've been showing, if you watch a TED Talk, I talk so much about hope mm -hmm. um, uh, in the poetry and the way I deliver. And for me, going through all of the things I've gone through in my life, we haven't spoken about them too uh, directly here, but, you know, extremely impoverished here in Canada, um, you know, the single parent family, you know, my mom became extremely mentally ill uh, right before my grade 10 year started. She was in and out of the hospital, suicidal. I had my own mental health challenges, um, et cetera. You know, all, all of my friends were getting arrested. Um, you know, I, I was dealing with, I was going to a school where, you know, the school's main objective was kind of to keep kids out of jail and get them to grade 12. Um, and to get them to graduate, not to send them to college or university. And so, you know, I, I was dealing with all these different things, and uh, I knew that I was aware of my environment. I was very cognizant of it, and I knew how challenging it would be for me, but I held on to the hope because I saw what losing hope could lead to. And I didn't. that doesn't mean that I had hope every single day, but... You know, if you average it out across 365, I was trying to be hopeful for, you know, 250. So by you holding on to hope, which you could have given up very easily, you are now a person who is a game changer in some people's lives. You have been named on several lists as, as being that game changer, that you, with your talks and your motivation, change lives something that we could have been denied had you given up that hope and you are right hope is everything if we have no hope there's no reason to carry on at all and i'm i'm so thankful that that you found where did you find that strength you know this is always a great question um i am so blessed i didn't realize how much of a privilege this was until you know adulthood but i just had a series of great teachers growing up name some because they uh, deserve they deserve to be named okay i want you I, to drop some names dude, okay i'm gonna start from from grade one um mr fang grade one miss bullen grade two miss granahan grade three my favorite teacher of all time <laughs> grade four miss thompson grade five miss granahan again grade six miss valentine who uh, was openly gay and you know taught us a lot about what that meant in the world um grade seven miss miller Grade eight, Miss Wilson. Um, you know, we get to high school. We talk about Mr. Monkley, Mr. Langley, uh, Mr. Lacey, <laughs> Mr. Hainola. Um, wow. You know, Miss Powell, who taught me calculus when I couldn't get it. Um, you know, there's so many names that I could drop. Okay, I want all those. I hope I hope those teachers are watching, or if you know of them, look at what you did. Look at the product. This is this is amazing. And there are so many teachers who there's so many teachers who give up hope themselves. Yeah, so, so. You know, Miss Rutledge, I forgot about her. I forget <laughs> Rutledge was also my, my older brother's favorite teacher. And, you know, we're eight years apart. So, like, that's the legacy that she carries. All right, um, now, now name the jerks. No, 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 I'm kidding. No, no. <laughs> you, know, you know what's funny is that I'm so lucky that I could really only name, well, one, one name I forget, but, you know, there, there's a. I'm not going to name any names. No, I'm not no, here to no. Yeah. Anybody, you know what I mean? But there, there are only really two who I could say, "Damn, I wish I never had those teachers." Yeah. And that's super lucky because uh, whether you're black or white or whatever, I mean, you know, there are teachers who really give a damn, and there are teachers who, you know, for whatever reason, not to, you know, blame anybody, but have a more challenging time in the role. Um, and I'm just really lucky that I, I had teachers who made it very clear to me that, you know, they believed in me and that I had potential because those times where my friends were about to break into a car or break into a house or whatever it is that they were doing, I would think, man, but 
I can't give up on my future because so and so believes in me. Wow. Wow. Man, that's powerful. Um, we talked earlier about the trans person who you you offended unknowingly and they brought it to your attention and then what I want to point out is that sometimes though this talking and this communication unfortunately sometimes can be done the wrong way so I don't know how this trans person reacted to you but it can't be done with anger on one side because if we say something and we're called on it, but we're called on it angrily, our reaction is going to be to dig our heels in and react angrily. So we have to have open, we talk about communication and conversation, we have to have open conversation, open communication. And this is, this is true in, in, in no matter what. So that I could say something, you know, Asante, you did this to me, and I need to be forgiving enough to, to allow you to say, oh, you know what, I'm sorry I did that, I didn't understand what, what I was doing, and, and back and forth. We're just not very good at that, you know? We're just not very good at that. You know, I think one thing for me is that I, I don't like to label people. And the reason I don't like to label people is because I, you know, and some people, you know, might think I'm idealist or stupid or whatever for, you know, thinking this and saying this is, I really do believe people can change and attitudes can change. And, and I believe that because I've seen it uh, in my own life. Uh, re with regard to that, uh, the trans person who, um, did not call me out, but called me in, so to speak, um, is what they did was they did not label me as transphobic. What they did was they told me what I did and how it made them feel and helped me understand, you know, well, not even didn't help me understand. They really just told me what I did and how it made them feel. I had to do the work to understand, right? But, um, they could have easily labeled me as something and you know and i understand why sometimes people do that because they're just so fed up with all the things that they have had to deal with that anger comes out in that kind of way um so um you know for me there's a level of understanding as to why that happens sometimes but uh i like to create space to have conversations and not everyone is going to be receptive to that conversation. And not everyone is uh, going to want to have that conversation. But, um, and, you know, for me, it's, if, if I run up against someone who's clearly not interested, I'm kind of like, okay, you know, do you. But I find that a lot of people actually are willing to have that conversation when you say, hey, you know, uh, let's talk about this thing that, you know, you just did or what happened. And, um, you know, sometimes people get their backs up against the wall at first and you're like, whoa, okay. Cool, let's, but still, let's talk about this. And um, then when they realize you're not going to attack them, you know, it kind of reduces the distance between you. Um, and then you could actually have a conversation about, hey, maybe you did this thing or said this thing that was hurtful or offensive, and I was impacted by it. And this is how. And uh, maybe if you run into a different situation again, maybe this is something that you can say or something that you can do. Um, and I say all this recognizing that this is how I deal with things because there are those who feel differently about it. Um, and, you know, ultimately, uh, I think we're all working together, but it's not always the burden of the person who was hurt to do all the work. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, it's complicated, Kevin. <laughs> it, well, understanding goes a long way. So yeah. if, if, let's say you and I were, were walking by your old school, and a, and a cop pulled you over and, and or, or stopped you and started talking to you, but not me, and then walked away. And then you were just like so angry. And I go, what's your problem, Asada? He just was asking you a couple of simple questions. Not, you know, I have to be able to understand to say, no, but this has happened over and over and over. And what, you know, why? And so, so. And I think the key in that situation, Kevin, would be that, if my white friend didn't understand why I'm so upset, allow me to tell you and then believe me. Yeah. You know, because one of the things that I, I think has made me most upset with what's happening in the United States with George Floyd is that it, it has taken that image and that video for us to be believed when we've been trying to say 
this is, you know, not necessarily that we're always getting killed, but we're being mistreated in so many ways. And we've been trying to tell that story for a long time. And sometimes that story has been deflected or not heard or um, alternative reasons are given to us uh, or, uh, uh, you know, there's our false equivalencies drawn or we're being gaslit. Uh, and really, you know, in the Me Too movement, we were implored to believe women and we should and hopefully we do. And now we want what well, we always wanted, but now is the moment where we start to believe black people. And one of the, a big problem comes then when we have the case of Regis Kuczynski Paquette here in Toronto, who uh, fell to her death a couple of days ago, 29 years old, and it's still being investigated by the SIU, but the, the trust is not there. The belief is not there. So indications are that, that she, she jumped. Accusations are that she was pushed by police. I'm, I'm hoping that, that that will be investigated thoroughly and properly, but people are not going to believe and trust the outcome of that investigation one way or the other on both sides because we've lost that trust, we've lost that faith that the system is out for everyone and to support everyone because it's not. And that's very, very sad. And, and I think what you are speaking to is one of the ramifications of what racism, the impact it can have on our society. For sure. For sure. You know, I, I don't want to talk too, too yeah, much. I, I know. I know. And, 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 I, and I say that because, you know, I know people who actually know the, the young woman uh, who unfortunately fell to her death. So I don't want to really disrespect anything that they stand for or um, what they have done in response. Would they, do they trust there's going to be justice? That there's going to be an, I don't want to say justice because we, I don't want to swing it one way or the other, but do they, tr do they trust there's going to be a true answer given up? What's your feeling on that? Uh, I think I, I tried to talk my way out of this when you talked to me right back yeah, in. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> Well, I would say, you know, frankly, I would say the trust isn't there. Yeah, My answer not. would be no. It, it's not. And that's not a surprise. That, that, that is not a surprise. And that's what's so sad. And that's what we need to all work on. Because we, we have a system that we need to trust. We need to trust police. We need to trust the SIU. We need to. And, and there is a, a, a large, well, I don't know if it's larger, but there is a, a segment of our society that cannot and for, for good reason. We need to change that, and we need to work on that. And the way we're doing it now isn't working. So let me recap, all right, with what we have talked about. In order for this to change, in order for us to affect change as, 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 as simple John and Jane Doe's out there, we first of all have to admit and realize there is a problem. For members of the black community, that's not difficult. For me, someone said, how could I not know there was racism in Barrie? Because, what, was I living under a rock? No, I didn't know there was racism there. Mm -hmm. So we need to admit, we need to see the problem. It's like Alcoholics Anonymous. You have to admit that you have a problem. Learn, and you were so strong on that. I love that. Learn about it. It's as simple as starting a Google search, what is racism? And then you go and down that rabbit hole. Is I'm still learning too. Right. So I, I'm committed to learning more about the same thing I'm fighting for right now that we're talking about. I'm not saying I have all the answers. I'm not saying that I'm always right. But I'm, you know, right now I'm trying to use the, the voice that I have. And, and also, you know, I'll probably walk away from everything that's been happening in the past week or two and say, do I actually, you know, am I understanding everything properly? You know, am I hearing, you know, the, the voices of those who are affected by Regis or it, everyone involved, you know, I, I need to make sure that I'm listening as well. Here's a, a Janine is saying my daughter is 10 and has faced res, racism all, already four times. I, I can't understand. And, and it's sad. I, I would be heartbroken if, if one of my children were subjected to it. I was four years old the first time I could remember being subjected to racism. Wow. Um, well, <laughs> unbelievable. And then talk. 
we need to talk openly. And we need to be allowed to say some things and make a mistake about it, but then be corrected about it. So I'm going on about how Martin Luther King was, was you know, and is revered, and, and most people would. But you're saying, hey, wait a minute, Kevin. Wait a minute. It, at the time, he wasn't so popular among white people. So, yeah, okay, yeah, I never really thought about that. He's always been a hero. He's been a hero of mine. He's been a hero of many people. But at the time, that wasn't so. So, yeah, that's, that's good. To, that's good conversation. And then you, you, you talked about... I, sorry, go ahead. Jump, sorry. Um, it, or, I don't know, maybe we were getting there, but uh, I think sometimes as we dive deeper into normalizing this conversation about race and you know other forms of discrimination is allies are not always going to be perfect and they will you know we i was going to say they but we won't get better if we don't grow together if you understand what i'm trying to say I, this is okay this is what i think you're saying and so please correct me if i'm wrong yeah you're saying that if someone, well, let's just call it for what it is, okay? Let's call it for what it is. White guy comes up to you and is just, Asante, this is, you know, I, I, see, I hear what you're saying. You're saying this, this, and this. Uh, and it, it's, uh, you know, you people have had, had it so tough. And you can get, sort of say, correct me on some things, saying, okay, Kevin, I, I really appreciate you being, trying to be an ally. So I'm going to accept you're not perfect. Here, here's really what I was saying. And then, you know, it, it go back and forth. I don't even know if I paraphrase that, that, that correctly, but... No, so I, mean, I, don't think we, I, we, I don't think either of us did a good, good job. <laughs> anything, we're, both, we're, we're both, we're both horrible way. public speakers, it turns out. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but, I mean, really for me, it's like, I've been in situations where, you know, I, I've been at a party, and, you know, maybe my white friend invited me to a party and there's a lot of white folks and not that many, you know, non white folks that white folks there. And, you know, maybe someone said something to me and I, I could be like, you know, eh, but does that mean that they're a 100 percent bad person? I don't know that. I don't know this person that well. They might have just said something that was, you know, offensive to me. And maybe it was something that they didn't realize was offensive. So I'm like, hey, you know, dude, like <laughs> maybe, you know. Sorry, just don't say that. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're going to give them the benefit of the doubt that they didn't do it as, as a racist comment. They just did it because of, igno of, of ignorance. And ignorance being a true term there. I don't mean they're ignorant, but they're ignorant mm -hmm. of that being offensive. Um, and, and the difference there is there are those who will hold on to that ignorance when it's presented to them, and there are those who won't. And the allies are those who won't. Mm-hmm. Don't take offense to it. I remember once, and this is this is small potatoes, uh, being at an event with a cameraman, and this is many, many years ago. And he said, "Kevin, you know you have bad breath." Now, I <laughs> I I took offense to it at first, but yeah. you know what? I look back on that. He did me a huge favor. He was right. I had halitosis, you know. So I I got it. I got I took care of it. But if I had stayed with being offended by it then i wouldn't have done anything truly for it and again i'm sorry i'm not trying to make a, a false equivalency there whatsoever i'm just i'm just saying that affecting change isn't always comfortable and we can't always feel you know get our feelings hurt because of it yeah and you know what, what's interesting is as we were having this conversation there's a part of me that's like uncomfortable like am i representing the conversation properly and and i think that's kind of part of it and may, maybe you know but i'm still going to have the conversation because it's important to have it i could have said no kevin i, I yeah thank I, goodness you didn't <laughs> collect all of my thoughts yet i don't know what i want to say you know you hit me up like three hours ago and i was like all right that's because you didn't you didn't answer your phone earlier that's why that was funny. I was in the shower when you called. Okay. <laughs> no, and I, you know what? And I thought it was important we had the conversation now rather than wait too long. So I really appreciate this. It's been my impression that you have represented the issues well, and and, and I and I hope that any 
transgressions you may have made or may have said something improperly will be forgiven by by people that that it, but but i think you know what you're 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 helping in a conversation in talking and we're not always going to be right in what we're talking about we're exchange the exchange of ideas is that an exchange of ideas so let's improve on your idea and then you improve on my idea and then i improve on and so on and so on and so on but i think i think you've spoken from the heart i i i admire your your perseverance and and adherence to that hope that has made you what you are today uh and and i know that you help a lot of people what can we plug for you uh, website uh twitter account what what uh, because you you do a lot of public speaking oh man i'm pretty terrible at self-promotion <laughs> but uh i mean uh i'm very googleable so i mean you can google me uh, yes. it might be a hard name to spell so I'll write it down um, uh, my Twitter handle is at Asante V. That's A S A N T E capital V. Um, Instagram nerdy dot black dot guy. Uh, Are you nerdy? I mean, I don't know. Some people say I'm cool, but on the lows, I think I'm I'm kind of a nerdy. What guy. makes you nerdy? Oh, I, I've I've just always been into video games. <laughs> <laughs> So I think that's a big piece. Well, now video games are kind of accepted and cool, but you and I, Kevin, know that growing up, <laughs> yeah. if you were like if you're into that, it was like yeah, yeah. Weird. So, um, but uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm just I'm also you know really just curious, and I'm always trying to learn. Yeah. So I don't use nerd in the pejorative sense. <laughs> no, that. no. Well, it it actually is a badge of honor now. I mean, it, <laughs> it it really is to be a nerd. I'm a nerd. I've always been a nerd and proud. Of, I've always been proud of being a nerd. I, I've always been proud of 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 really you know going that extra mile and and learning all the time and and always looking up things and i i have so much useless trivia that asani you, I, I i could amaze you with that or bore you to death with it i should say we should watch jeopardy together oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> this has been fantastic and and i hope that a conversation that you and i have had will allow others who are watching to have conversations of their own. And, and I don't want people to have conversations, as you called uh, before, uh, performative, a performative activism, where you just, oh. our paths crossing and in fact i would you come back on in a few days and let's just let's just talk about mental health yeah 100 percent. could we do that because i think you touched on that word hope and i've never really given that word much thought before so it's we're like this is on which i live my life we so. we are going to do a, an entire show on the word hope let's do it all right thank you so much asante you stay safe you. very nice to meet you nice, uh, nice to meet you handshake. nice to meet you too sir <laughs> all right Bye bye. Take it easy. Have a good night. All right, Asante Hatton talking to me uh, from his uh, from his home, uh, and uh, that was that was quite a a, a conversation. Uh, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna mute the uh, the, the one Skype. Yeah, there there we go. Sorry, that was that was an incredible conversation, um, and it's a conversation that a lot of people are afraid to have, and it goes both ways. I might be afraid to say something because I might offend someone, and. It, it someone else may be afraid to say that I've said something offensive because they're afraid of offending me. And, and so here we have two parties who are afraid of offending each other and nothing gets done and nothing gets changed. Um, it is, and like I said, I'm breaking a rule here about bad news. And I don't want this to be about bad news. I don't want us to concentrate and get anxiety about what we are seeing happen. But what I want us to do is not be part of that performative activism that Asade talked about. I want us to walk the walk as well. So when we hear someone who is saying an off-color joke, when we see something happen, we need to speak up. We need to do that but the first step 
the very first step, and Asante said it so well, was just Google it. So you start out saying, what is racism, okay? Or just the word racism. Just Google racism, and then read some of the articles about it, and then read some of the studies that have been done. And before long, you're going to be two hours into it, learning things you may not have known. Sitting quiet does nothing. In fact, it's worse because you allow something to continue that shouldn't continue. One human being should not be on top of a, a one human being who is supposed to be a person of authority should not have his knee on the neck of another human being for something that was a simple disturbance call. That's all it was. And there were other officers that stood around and let it happen. And they were wrong. I might even say more wrong than the officer who killed that man. Do you know why? Because the officer who killed that man had a record. We knew he was racist. We knew what he was like. So we're not going to change him. And I know there's people out there right now who I'm not going to change. I'm not going to read. I'm not going to reach. I know that. I'm not after you anyway. You're lost causes. But those officers that stood around, I don't know. Did they sort of like get uncomfortable and think, oh, I should do something, I should do something? Well, do something. We all need to stand up. And we, t we talk so much about stress and anxiety, and, and, I, and I've, I've told you, try and differentiate from what you can and what you can't control, because that's where stress and anxiety get its roots. If you can't control it, then you, can, then, then you need to let it go. So what's happening right now with all those fights, the fires, the riots, you honestly, and I know it's very difficult to say, you need to stop, take a breath, and you need to let that part go. What part can you control? The part you can control is in your life and in your experience. If you see something, you say something. You can control how much you know truly about racism. I grew up in Barrie. The person in the comments said, what, did you grow, under a, grow up under a rock that you didn't know there was racism? Yeah. And maybe if I would researched, maybe if I would learned a bit more, I would have been a little bit more aware. Racism is there. Whether it is aimed at black people, whether it is aimed at Chinese people, whether it is aimed at an indigenous person, it's there. And I think most people, I think the vast majority of people don't want it to be there. I think the vast majority of us are good people. Most people don't want racism to exist. We want to wipe it out, but we're quiet and we stay quiet. And those with the racist thoughts and the horrible thoughts continue on their merry way, thinking that everything they do is just fine. And I'm asking everyone to stand up and say, it's not fine. And that is where we start. And that is what I mean when I say, take care of yourself, but take care of each other. COVID-19, why you do?